This is the 19th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guy Batteries, X Zone Lures, Shoreline Boat and RV Repair, Spro, Gamakatsu, Big Bite Baits, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk, where we are going to talk about bass fishing. Yes, I am back in the studio after the third Bassmaster Open EQ of the season on Bugs Island or Kerr Reservoir in Virginia. And then that was a really cool tournament. We're going to actually dive deeper into that tomorrow. I picked a good dude, apparently, to do my uh, open EQ recaps with, Ben Milliken. Uh, The hottest guy on earth right now, probably the hottest thing going in professional bass fishing. Like I've said every time, like I will have multiple texts before events from guys that are on the elite series and the BPT going, Hey, have you talked to Milliken? Is he catching them? Is he going to catch him again? What's he doing? Like I I was sitting, uh, at a, well, I was sitting at a, at like a bar slash restaurant next to the Marina at Bugs Island. Because when you're like me and you cash a check, you need that check before you go home. So I was waiting for the check. I had to wait for the weigh-in to get finished. And there's this just random guy sitting next to me. He's probably about 23, 24 years old. And I got a steak because we'd eaten Mexican six nights in a row and I was needing a steak. And I said, uh, he said, hey, did you fish that tournament? I said, yeah. He said, how'd you do? I said, I'm waiting. I got to wait till the tournament's over to get a check. He goes, hey, let me ask you a question. He goes, "Uh, do you know a guy named Ben? I said Ben Milliken. He goes, yeah, that's it. He goes, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to date a chick who's got a nephew that's obsessed with that guy. Is there any way you could get me Ben Milliken's autograph? And I just started laughing. I mean, this is just a random guy in a bar in Virginia that wanted Ben Milliken's autograph. So, uh, we'll dive into the Bassmaster Open on Bugs Island uh, tomorrow, uh, and then Wednesday. The owner of the bass tank, there's been some changes. Uh, I saw if you saw the Wired to Fish article that went out uh, and uh, John Sokup Fish in the Elite Series recently. There's been some changes at the bass tank, uh, still involved with uh, BTL. So the owner of the bass tank, Scott Palmer, will be on uh, Wednesday. You know him as the mad scientist, the guy who can explain how everything works in a unit and not just how to use the unit. And then also Josh Bertrand uh, having a solid year. Some good finishes. Josh Bertrand from Arizona on Wednesday. And then, as always, day four with the man, Frank Scalish. Really good show today. I try to get him on at least once a year. Usually, it's a little bit more than once a year because he's winning events. That is none other than uh, Talala, Oklahoma's Edwin Evers. And we got some very interesting stuff to talk about before we get into it. We have quite possibly the biggest freak show in the history of tournament fishing that went down on Lake Okeechobee. Uh, And Edwin is no stranger to big bass in florida so i want to get his take on how something like this happens in the roland martin marine tournament series that took place on may 6th so i'll bring him in there see if he can unmute his mic that is a power move with the uh guy i'm jealous of that aquarium in the background edwin thanks for jumping on btl thanks for having me man it's great to be here as always uh, do you follow Ben Milliken? Like, do you have you noticed what he's doing? Have you seen what oh, he's doing? Yeah, yeah, he's uh, yeah, I was really excited for him on that deal that he did at Toledo Man. He blew the doors off that thing wide open. Do you know him at all? Like, on a personal level, have you talked no. with him? No, not at all. I think not it's interesting. All. Like, the top YouTubers are all trying to get into the tournament fishing, and then the top tournament fishing are all <laughs> trying to get established on YouTube. You're one of those guys who's done a really good job of of melding tournament angling with the YouTube side of it and the educational side. Like, as far as as educational side, boy, you have really given up some. I find myself when I want to figure out how to do something, going to your channel, like whether it's getting like waypoints from Google Earth onto your unit just very educational thank you thank you it's a it's a lot of work but i'm really enjoying it it's a it's been a lot of fun it kind of i you know you just you i've been fishing so long it's just kind of giving me something to uh, i don't know light another fire under me and uh uh just hearing it from all the fans and 
everywhere you go, you just, you hear people, man, I watch your channel. I love it. And it just, uh, just makes me want to do it that much more. I'm also excited. What is the status on the new pond, the, the panfish <laughs> pond? Because I'm a big crappie, r- red ear, log nose, sun, like all those well, sunfish I love. So just to clarify, you know, I did. I built two ponds. Uh, one of them tried to put trophy bluegill in. Supposedly I can get them to two and three pounds. And the, and the one below it, I'm going to put smallmouth in. Those are great. Like the bluegill pond completely filled up. The pond below, it's got like three more feet to fill up. We haven't had much rain. But, you know, like the bigger question is I, I want to build like a, a lake. And I've been two years in the process dealing with permits from the, the Corps of Engineers. And it's just frustrating. I mean, it's just highly frustrating. Unfortunately, the the, the, the person that I got attached to moved to Tennessee. So it's just really slowed down the process. And, and I... Hopefully one of these days I, I get, I hear from them every couple months and they need something else and they need something else. we got to, I'm not making light of the situation, but you know, we got to make sure there's no endangered snails out there. We got to make this sure. This is on your land in Talala, like the out in the middle of nowhere. Yes, sir. Wait, so yeah. you're saying you can't just get a backhoe and start digging a hole out there and fill it with water? Like it takes. No, sir. No, really? Sir. You, it, anything over 25 acre feet of water. So if you had a pond, one acre, 25 feet deep, or two acres, 13 and a half feet deep, anything bigger than that, you have to have a permit and a lot of permits, like all kinds of permits. Um, Did you know this going into it? No, I had no idea. It'd be this hard. <laughs> I bought a bulldozer two years ago. The thing's going to rust before I ever really get to use it. So, uh, no, I did not know this at all. Would you do it again in hindsight, knowing what you now know, or is a pond something that is a, takes a lot more than you realized starting it from scratch? I mean, it was just like, it was just terra earth. It was just land. And you were like, I would like to catch smallmouth and bluegill in this space on my property. Those ponds are done. Like they're just yeah. little one acre ponds. You know, those are really cool. I've always wanted to have a lake like you know, Jimmy Houston's or, you know, like the Basil Savage, you know, he's got some really neat lakes. I've just always wanted to have a place where I could take people fishing, you know, take like, like, you know, sponsors or kids that it takes four five, six hours to fish the whole thing. Right. And, uh, I mean, I've wanted that for a long time and, and like my whole career, and I just, my fingers are crossed that it, one of these days we'll get it done and I'll be able to grow some bass in it before, <laughs> but you know, before it's too late, you know, I just, it's a, it, it'd be really cool if we can get this all done. I had a, I had Gene in studio a couple of weeks ago, Gene Gillen, you know, Gene, you've known Gene forever. And he was talking about how all the different mixing of strains like F ones and then the tiger bass and then all the different genetic, it would be cool to be able to start it from scratch and actually build the genetics the way you like it with bass. Yeah. I think that's, I can't wait because that one thing I I was told to do from, from Steve Barden, the guy that's going to help me is I have to kill, you know, my, my brother-in-law, Terry butcher has got a lot of ponds and my father-in-law. So I got to go through and kill all the bass and bluegill and all those ponds that drain into this lake. Oh, so get so we into have it. the right genetics in the lake and then go restock everything. So, uh, it's going to be kind of neat. Out of all of the, uh, obviously you talk about the tiger bass F one's aggressive fish. Like you've, you've done, I'm sure those tank demos where you could throw, uh, as Mark Jeffries would say, a Nike in there and they would attack it. And those are like the tiger bass. Like as far as a tournament lake, where are the most aggressive bass that you've ever fished where you're like, holy cow, you get a wet around one and they just go ham on it. You know, those herring lakes, you know, and then Murray's fresh on my mind because we came there, but those herring lakes, those are a different breed of bass out there. I, I You can't reel a bait fast enough. You can't, I mean, it, they're all trying to get it. And and there's a tremendous amount of pressure on those bass. I, I, I kind of feel like Murray and, uh, you know, Clark's Hill, I really like that strain of bass they got in there. It is. It seems like when they're determined that they're going to get it, they're going to, mm-hmm. cause those are the fish that'll come after it four five, six, seven times, especially on top. And they'll just keep coming after it until they get it. Definitely. It's, it's some of the most memorable fish catches I've ever had. Just, and, and probably footage that we've all seen on, on TVs, you know, just the mm-hmm. 
annihilating those pencil poppers and those kinds of things. Yeah, I still think uh, probably the most underrated championship event ever as far as watching or viewing would was Justin Atkins win on the pencil popper. That was on Lake Murray, I believe. That was just, I mean, dude, he's fishing for what, $300,000, and he's in the championship event, and he just has four and five pounders just flushing his pencil popper. Like, that's just, and I don't, you don't hear much about that event anymore, but that was such a crazy event to watch. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I forgot all about that one, but you're 100% right. You see, you forgot you about it, like too. Bass fishing, or you got to introduce somebody to bass fishing. That's where you want to introduce them to. I mean, my son, I was taking him fishing the other day, and, uh, I didn't mean to take take you off of your subject, but no, no, we're good. Big old giant rat bait that I just bought, just trying to learn about it. He's like, Dad, let me throw that. Well, the the kid threw it for three or four hours, never had a bite on it, but never stopped throwing it because he wanted a bite on a top mm-hmm. water. So I, I, my story is like, no better way to introduce somebody to bass fishing than top water fishing. And Justin Atkins, get, you know, having all those four and five pounders blow up on a top water, it's just you're hooked for life when you have that kind of experience. That's good stuff. My, first, uh, my very first fishing trip I ever took bass fishing that I remember was a guided trip to Stockton Lake on the old triple wing plastic Norman buzz bait. I caught three bass that day. I was fifth or sixth grade. And here I am today. Like, you know, I, it just, it, it, and I caught them all on a Zipco 33 classic. Really? Yep. It was pretty the triple, cool. The triple wing buzz bait is drastically underrated. <laughs> I don't have any. Do you? Uh, no, but the three blade, like, didn't doesn't Strike King make a three, the three blade? And I remember one, if they've got like rivets in the actual blade then, and it spins, yeah. like, you don't hear of anyone here. No, you is don't. this, you, let me see if I can. It really slow. Let me see if this is what you're talking about. Is that the one you're talking about right there? Yeah, that's it. It was a plastic blade, though. I remember. Oh, that's plastic. okay. See the rivets in the blade there. Yeah. Norman, is that? No, that's a metal blade too. Yeah, I remember it was clear plastic, but they also made one that was like, uh, didn't they make one that was like a chartreuse see-through plastic too? That was the one. That yeah. was the one I caught him on. Exactly the one. Dude, I, I legit think I might know a place where those are still on the shelf. Really? Yeah. You need to share that with me. I will share I that with you. That's, that's I will really, share that with you like, after the show. I kind of always think that's what really got me started. It is. I mean. That would. uh <clears throat> While we're talking about getting hooked on fishing and big bass and stuff, this we I kind of tease this bringing it in. The Roland Martin Marine Tournament Series, May 6th out of Okeechobee. And I had always heard, uh, okay, Okeechobee, do you not agree, has been in a weird cycle with water rights and the coast there. And you hear about uh, Scott has, has kind of taken up the charge as far as mm-hmm getting that water stable so they have vegetation that clarifies it the tournaments there have been like hey it's really good but only in certain areas and okeechobee might kind of be in trouble they must have just hit this one dead nuts on the numbers because i did in my 15 years of covering this i've never seen in a, a tournament that even remotely came close to the weights in this event on may 6th i would have loved to have been there just to be a part of that when you look down through there and how many 30 pound bags and high 20 pound bags and that just had to be all time fun yeah you got it right there all right there it is right there well this was this was wow uh, this was whoa that's not good (laughs) okay i gotta figure out how to get get rid of that yeah the word was that the lake was gone and it was bad and and i think obviously they're dealing with some issues with that high water down there but uh you imagine if they get yeah. that thing stable and that thing's as stout as it is right there. It, it'd be I, interesting to know, or if you've talked to anybody down there, did they all come from really small areas or, or did the whole lake fire? Yeah. Okay. I got it right now. Uh, there were 20 bags over. Listen to this. This Just comprehend this. There were 20 bags. There are about 200 boats in this tournament. 180 something. It's big team tournament. 20 bags over 30 pounds. 
now. <laughs> 55 bags or 52 bags over 25 pounds. 52 bags over 25 pounds and 66 bags over 20. Now the 66 over 20, I've seen that on grand in the nickels before, but the winning weight in that event was only 23 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, it, the 52 over 25 is just. Yeah. So incredible. 36, 36, 35, 33, 33. There are some guys down here that I feel really bad for. Like, could you imagine being Ray Ruiz and Ryan Tran? They they come oh, wow. in with 2781 with an 848 kicker. Wow. They don't even cash a check. The last place oh. to cash a check was 2846. Wow, that had to hurt. That had to really hurt. They did it with seven it. rounders. Yeah, the the lead team, the top team, only had eight thirty seven with thir- only eight thirty seven with thirty six eighty two. But wow. look at these weights. This is just absolutely insane. You know, my question to you, Matt, and you fish down there a bunch. Where, like, that lake will make you look plum silly. Not, you know, you know, you're doing all you can to catch fifteen, seventeen pounds at certain times. <laughs> yeah, but. Would you not agree that Okeechobee, more so than any other fishery, I've heard I've heard both Florida and non-Florida guys say, boy, if you could figure out the middle of that lake, there's got to be somewhere in the middle of that lake. And it's almost like it's openness and ocean-like qualities protected, almost like the timber protects it on Toledo Bend and Lake Fork, regardless of how much pressure it gets. And then you get those magical days where those fish appear. Yeah. Do you not I mean, think that there's a big population of seven to tens out in the middle of that thing that every when the star literally the stars align, they come to the bank and they're catchable? It has to be, you know, it, it has to be. But I mean, that, that's like saying go find something in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's what I, mean, I think protects them. I've never like been across. I have fished just around. I, I've fished Okeechobee like two or three times, but I've never like done the across the middle thing you have i mean is it like an ocean out there is there any it's just featureless you can hardly see the bank i mean you're out there and it's flat and there's just nothing to relate to there's no buoys there is zero out there to ever say oh let's start right here i mean zero there's i think over on that east side there's a couple rock veins that are fairly close to the shore but the other thing about it is that when i've been across it it's like Oklahoma mud. You can't see this far. And in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, those fish live out there somehow, some way. But I mean, mud, like it's just dirty, dirty water. I believe it's the fifth largest lake yeah. in the country. And this is, doesn't do it justice on MapQuest. But to see what we're saying, I mean, you have like your popular areas where everyone fishes. But look at this just... Abyss. Massive. It's literally just a massive. I mean, it's like the ocean out there. Look at that. There it is. There's nothing there. Just yeah, a there giant. Zero. There, zero. Zero. And your your depth finder doesn't change depths. I mean, it's it's not like there's grass out there. Or there's. You know, but I don't do you know. think there's fish out there? Do you think that's where they do live, or do you think they end up getting back into? I mean, how does something like this happen when you can have a bunch of stuff where you only catch fifteen to seventeen? I don't know. In my mind, I, I, you know, you always hear about people talking about these fish that are really white and like JT Kenny would be a guy that would know way more than I would that come in from the lake. So there's obviously some that do, but you know, in my mind, I think the lake was really high this year. I think they probably just get away from you. I mean, you can go for probably four or five miles from the hard reed edge in certain areas of that lake that it's three, four five feet deep for miles back through the reeds that you can't access. I mean, there's just no physical way to get a boat through there and fish. And, you know, you've got to think there's just areas and openings and, and areas back there that those fish could get away from, from you. And you'd never see it. They'd never see a lure ever. Uh, I don't know how accurate this is, but Mike soul is saying commercial catfish netters on Okeechobee catch monster bass out in the middle. Oh, wow. There Wouldn't that go. be something? Could you imagine the next Derby's one out in the middle of Okeechobee, like yeah. Lake St. Clair style? Oh, wow. Just dripping. Have you ever heard of anybody catching them out there? Like, have never. you ever gone back and never. been like, dude, I, I caught a six on a hump out in the middle? 
No, I've never heard of anything. Have you heard of anybody even attempting to catch him out in the middle? Like you offshore in the middle of the lake. I mean, people that live down there would have. I mean, I, I'd love for I, I'll be I'll be listening to you because I know you're gonna get somebody on here that knows. I would love to talk to someone who's like, yeah, like 18 miles out, there's a little ridge and I smash him on it. Yeah, that'd be cool. Then then we'd all spend the rest of our life trying to find it because it would take a lifetime to try to find it. It's that big out there. Yeah, but with forward facing now, you could actually like take advantage uh, of it and see no. those pelagics that are swimming around out there. You know, when you go to St. Clair, there is stuff out there on your depth finder that you see that would keep you going, keep you. There's interested. nothing on Okeechobee. No, it's no. just it's just flat, barren, yes. dead water. I mean, there's areas, but what I know about those rock veins, they're within a mile, two miles of the shore. I'm, I guess there's stuff out there, but. Again, it, it's the size of St. Clair. It is huge. St. Clair at least has like a map of, of stuff out there. There's nothing on a map that even shows you anything. Else. Mike says there is a ridge that you can find on Google Maps. There you go. Keep us informed, Mike. It's about 20, 23 miles just across the lake. Hmm. There's not too many fisheries where you can't, outside of the Great Lakes, that you can get on and not see shore in any direction. Yeah. That's one of them. That is one of them. Uh, you also mentioned the high school stuff when I called to get you on the show. I believe your son had some success in that as well, too. And then you were emceeing it or what what do we have going on in the high school world? So the Oklahoma State Championship was this weekend. Uh, it's the biggest tournament in Oklahoma or one of the bigger tournaments in Oklahoma uh, for high schoolers. So the junior side was Saturday. Uh my son won, and my and his partner Grady Vogel. I, I don't know how to, uh, to describe the feeling and the excitement, um, and just to back up a little bit to tell everybody, when me and Coach Salt started this uh, uh, high school fishing team, junior junior and high school fishing team, I was talking to Rick Emmett. I think you know Rick mm-hmm. uh, used to be at Bass Pro, and now is the jury team. And I was just asking for some guidance and some wisdom. And it, it happened to be right when I picked my son up from school and, and Rick was talking about, yeah, I'll recruit your son when uh, he gets to be of age. I said, ah, oh, Rick, he's not going to be on it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this high school deal just for all the kids here in the community. Well, I hang up, dad, I'm going to be on your fishing team. Well, I'm like, son, you really don't fish. I mean, you don't even, I ask you to go all the time and you don't go. I, I'm going to be on it, dad. I was like, okay, buddy. So that's what I was working with when we started the season. Mm-hmm. And uh, he has come such a long ways. Like, like this past weekend, I mean, there was no taking a break halfway through a cast. He'd have crackers in his pocket and he'd eat a cracker and then keep reeling and then eat a cracker and then all in the same cast. And, and this weekend, like it, it, uh, he just had a lot of fun. Like he was really involved and engaged. And and his partner Grady Vogel, he's a great angler. Like he's you know, he can flip and pitch. And and oh. uh, they they've made a really really good Edward team. Edward froze. You're back. Oh man. You, you, no, you're back. You just froze momentarily. I was pulling okay. up the post there. That was on uh, Saturday. That was on Grand. Yeah, it was on. Grand. Oh, they had a pretty good sack. Those looks like some really nice ones. Yeah, they did really good. They they uh, it was really really exciting. And then Sunday, I boat captained for another uh, high school team. Um, and yeah, I, I left Grand really really frustrated as a coach because <laughs> we had four teams within six ounces of making the national championship. I had Bo Barrett and oh. Logan Kerr miss it by one ounce. I had Gavin Salt and his partner, Gavin Mullins. They missed it by two ounces. The team I captain missed it by two ounces. Warren Pierce and his partner missed it by six ounces. I mean, it was just – and I – for our first year, I need to be happy. But, man, I was frustrated. I, I would have – it was like I, like, like I just lost the tournament. So you started the team and coached the team then? Well, me and Coach Salt. There's a guy by the name of Brent Salt that's a okay. big help. I couldn't. Yeah, I know that. him. He fishes. He fish, he's a tournament fisherman too, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. He catches them. Yeah. Yep. So that's it's gotta be exciting. Uh, I, I love it. They actually have their own little YouTube channel. Uh, what is it? Just the Uigalatalala fishing team. Okay. And uh, we 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 uh, you know try to video all our practices. We we meet at a swimming pool and we practice flipping and. 
And I had a couple kids. I got to, I got like, I got to tell you, I had my kids like, man, we're getting kind of bored with all this casting practice. And after this week at Grand and captaining for them, I'm like, guys, we need to have a whole lot more casting practice, you know, trying to get those baits behind and underneath those docks. But uh, it, I, I can go on and on about it because, Matt, I, I really am enjoying it. I got a great, great group of kids, and uh, uh, it's a lot of fun. So is Cade, like, all in on it now? Like, is he, is he like, dude, I want to be a professional angler. I want to do this. I want to fish collegiately. Like, is it to that long. level yet? No, I don't think he's gone that far yet, but I think he's really having fun. I think he's super just what we need. Another dominant angler with a kid who's going to be the next generation. I saw Marshall Robinson just had a a heck of a tournament there on uh, on Lake of the uh, Lake of the Ozarks uh, in the MLF Invitational. He had a shot to win that sucker. Yeah, I just it's funny because like Cal Lane, you know Chris's boy. I used to put the chain back on his bike in the campgrounds twenty years ago, and now he's. He's competing. Same thing with Marty's kid. You know, I remember him being at the signups, you know, when he's a little bitty kid. Now yep. he's winning tournaments. It's just out in junior. <sighs> they both yeah. have the heavy hitters. Like I was watching, yeah. I, was, I was doing my Bugs Island research and there's like a 90s tournament and he couldn't even see over the weigh-in stage and he's up there with Alton. <laughs> wow. It's insane. Just do you yeah, think yeah. that, uh, to me, it seems like there's certain stuff you're around guys like yourself, like professional eggers, and it's just like you just have a basic foundation that gets ingrained into you that you don't understand. It's like starting a sport when you're young. It's really hard to become top level in a sport if you start it later in life. Now, there's abnormalities in everything, but you just build and you're around it and you just take things for granted and build a foundation of knowledge to where your decision making is quicker and the younger and easier it gets into it and repetition over and over. It just, yeah, everyone right. wants to say it comes more naturally, but you're just kind of immersed in it from such a very young age. 100%. Not just the, uh, the, the general casting and, and all that stuff and equipment and preparation that those kids see their dads do. Uh, but then, like you said, the decision making, um, the tempo, just the tempo, like a lot of, a lot of, a lot of these kids that I'm coaching, man, they just don't realize the tempo and the opportunity is just as grand the last five minutes of that tournament as it is the first five minutes of the tournament. And those cows and, and marshals and, and, uh, you know, Bo Brownings and, and, oh, and yeah, you can't forget Al junior, all those kids, you know, they're how they, they, they know those tempos. Like they just, they know it's just, it can happen in the last five minutes like it can the first, you know, and it's, and just like, you know, this week was really kind of a tough week because I could take those kids and we could go get a lot of bites, just throwing a wacky worm or shaky head down the bank. And Mm -hmm. you would just catch all the 12 to 15 inches you wanted to catch, but you know, getting a big bite was random. You, you could never really say, Hey, I'm going to catch a big one here. I am. These are better than average fish. And, and uh, you know those 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 kids that are growing up underneath their dads or, or have, I think they can just recognize those scenarios on the lake a lot easier. What are you looking at, Matt? Oh, I'm still trying to find that plastic triple wing buzz bait. It's bugging <laughs> me that I can't find a picture of it. It was I remember it was so hard to cast, and then it made like a made a gurgling sound, not a squeaking sound. It was like a. Brrrr. I had to it throw it because that Zebco 33 is like a two to one gear ratio reel. And like he had a two wing buzz bait, but you couldn't reel it fast enough on that Zebco 33. So I had to have that three wing one. And uh, I didn't catch near as many fish as the guy did, but I caught three. And yeah. it, uh, my first tournament experience ever, I was 13 and it was with a Zebco 33 and a, a Pommy special. You ever heard of that? I have no the, the Marlin Pommy special. I know I have Detail. one. What is Do it? I have a picture of one back there. I I ha- oh, yeah. Here it is right here. Uh, it's, it's a, I've talked about this before. It's a short arm spinner bait. See that? Yeah. So this was, uh, this was designed in the Ozarks Palm out of Blue Terry. Springs, Missouri, Palm to tear. Yeah. It's got actually a little wire thing in there because it was, uh, the musky that were in there, but it's a oh, short arm yeah. spinner bait that looks like it. But when you get it up on the surface, it's a buzz bait. Oh, blah, 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 And they, I mean, they haven't made it for ever. Yeah. And uh, 
I drew a guy named Bob Evans. I've told this story before. A guy named Bob Evans who was sponsored by Bob Evans and made the Red Man All American. Oh wow! And uh, he had me throwing this in a youth tournament that I had signed up for, and I had Gorilla Braid on a Zebco <laughs> thirty three, and I was throwing this, and uh, we finished fifth in the first tournament. So that was my first. My first right. tournament fishing experience, but it was, you know, a top water, same thing with the Zebco. Before we take a break, what's the story with the uh with the aquarium? You just spent too much time at Bass Pro and it felt like home, so you decided to bring Bass Pro to the Evers residence? I just liked it. It's a uh, it's a lot of fun. I've had some really cool fish in there through the years. Uh, I've had it for a long time. Uh, we had it in the previous house before the tornado hit our house and uh, it didn't get damaged and we moved it in here and it's fun feeding them. I don't know what else to say. It's just how many gallons cool. is that? Uh, it's about a thousand. Oh my gosh! Do you have an uh, aquarium guy? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like a pool yeah, guy, yeah. the aquarium guy comes in, make sure everything's good. They get yeah. clean it and everything. Yeah, he he helps me a bunch with. In those windows, you can see those two circles in the back. That's yeah. in the in the in the guest bedroom. There's curtains over. Uh, but uh, it's really cool. It's I just love feeding them. Like the, you know, catching bluegill out of the pond and. It's just fun feeding them. And, and you would be amazed. Like, I need, I've, I've got to get some videos of it, but they will pin a bluegill against the bottom and they will eat that. Let's say a little bitty bluegill. And they will eat that and they'll eat just as many rocks as that bluegill, but yet they can spit, they'll, they'll spit those rocks out for the next 30 minutes, 30 seconds to two minutes. And, and they'll just keep chunking rocks out and they'll keep that bluegill in. It's just amazing to me. Uh, Nate would like to know, have you ever noticed when your aquarium fish are active, is the bite better out on the actual water? Like, does that, did you notice barometric pressure changes and moon cycles and stuff on your aquarium fish? Man, Nate, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I don't study it that hard. I, I should, I've never like looked at the aquarium, then go fishing or looked at it when I get <laughs> back home from not catching them. Yeah. You know, I always need more excuses why I didn't catch them and I should do that. But, uh, uh, no, I don't. I don't study it that hard. I should, but I don't. Well, I mean, you look at your resume. I think you're you're doing just fine. You're back to uh, you be snuck in last year. You had a 40th place finish, I believe, in 2022, and and uh, wasn't Redcrest on Grand too? So you like barely made Grand last year. No, uh, 40th barely got me into Norman. Oh, barely got you into Norman. Oh, where yeah. you finished third. Yes, sir. Okay, but you're back on track this year. Uh, eighth at heavy hitters. You have a 17th in stage one and stage three with a 24th. Uh, so you're seventh overall in the angler of the year, like I said, with the third place. We'll talk a little bit more about the season, uh, and then we'll get into some glide baits when we come back. It's Edwin Evers, Monday, May 8th on BTL. We'll be back right after this. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised, and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry-leading design coupled with tournament-winning performance. The Puma STS from BassCat. Feel the rush. eating kind of man and on behalf of all of those bigger i gotta say it once and for all it's bad enough that the fish look smaller in our hands the last thing we should have to worry about is getting quality outdoor clothing that fits afco any fish any water elite series pro daryl gleason here my Pro Guide batteries keep me going on those long tournament days and long practice days. Always plenty of juice, never fail. The best part about Pro Guide batteries, it's the people behind the company. 
They have over 40 years experience in the battery business, keeping all of us fishermen out on the water longer, catching more fish. Check them out at ProGuideBatteries.com. What's up, Bass Talk Live fans? Brandon Polinick here. And ever since I won a couple Bassmaster Elite Series events on X-Zone Lures, I've been getting a bunch of questions of what makes them so special and different. And really, the truth is, it's in the details. The little details, things like no cheap fillers in their plastic, that gives you more lifelike action, more realistic and vibrant colors. But don't just take my word for it. Go to www.xzonelures.com and check them out for yourself. Have you considered purchasing new electronics for your rig? The type of mounts you choose to protect your investment should be part of the decision-making process. No matter if you prefer one, two, or three graphs up front, Beatdown Outdoors has a solution for you. Adjustable, versatile, rigid, and made in the USA. What's your ultimate electronic setup? Check out the full selection of Beatdown Outdoors products by visiting BeatdownOutdoors.com. All right, welcome back, BTL, on a Monday. Have you seen that? B- I'm sure you've got, dude, you're, you are a sponsor loaded to the hilt, so I'm sure that you are. Oh, no, that's uh, really cool. Justin McClellan, he's part of that deal. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a really cool deal. I need to look into that a little more. Those are going to be the beatdown mounts are going to, that is the next power pole. Yeah. It'll be like, kids, remember when we used to have to strain our necks to look at our graphs? Yeah. Just like it'd be like, remember when we saw something we wanted to fish, we either had to throw an anchor out or fish it as we drifted past it. Yeah, it, You'll just take it for granted. They're really cool. Now, I don't ever hardly use the actual like full extending thing all the way up unless I'm crappie fishing. Uh, but I will bump it up like eight inches off of the deck because you can kind of run with it like that. And it's amazing just that extra separation that you can get. It gets it closest to you. And that little muscle whatever this muscle is right <laughs> the one that you need to yeah they're right there yeah we're like if you touch it you're like ah uh, yeah it that doesn't get tender anymore now because you're not like straining with your That's head awesome. down. It's I, I went to a 16 inch screen up there to try to help with it a little bit but so that mm-hmm. would it, it, it would probably save a, an angler a lot of money if you went to that 12 and just raised it up you know that would be a lot better deal yeah 100 percent uh all right let's get into your year uh, back on track in the top 10, basically a little bit over a third of the way through the year. Uh, solid finishes in both heavy hitters and red crest. Uh, feeling good about where you are heading into kind of the meat of the season, Edwin? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's going good this year. Just uh, kind of, you know, I don't know, just wasn't as focused as I needed to be the last couple of years and uh, just reprioritize some preparation things that I, that I always did and, and uh, just not leaving the house in such a rush. When I leave the house, I feel like everything's ready. And uh, that's kind of, uh, you know, just being, the, you know, I, I tell my kids all the time, it's, it's fishing is so mental. And, uh, you know, when you leave the house and you're hooked up to your boat and everything's tied on that you think you might ever need and every backup lure is possibly in the truck and, all the hooks are sharp before I ever leave the house. Like I, I'm a guy that prepares, like I, it will take me all week this week to get everything just dialed into what I want to have ready to go to, to Gunnersville and, and then hopefully go spend one day at grand, you know, just fishing some of those baits. Uh, you know, I, I do that a lot. I'll even tie a bait on, like I'll tie one on and I'll go fish with it in the pond for five, 10 minutes mm-hmm. just to, I don't know. It just kind of, you know, I just do. And, and, uh, yeah, the decision-making, everything's been going really good this year. What is like, what is left for you now? What's driving you? I mean, you have pretty much every, what titles don't you have seriously? Cause you've got a classic, you've got a red crest, you've got like, as far as major wins, you've won, you've got regular season wins on both BPT and elite series. What do you have at AOY wise? Do you have an AOY yet? I do on the Bass Pro Tour side. Okay. Uh, so literally, it's like you and Hackney who have pretty much everything except one. Like Hackney doesn't have a classic. So the only thing you're missing is what a Bass AOY. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just enjoy it, Matt. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. I, I, I just. I'm just having fun. And so if you're having fun, why quit what you're doing? Um, 
and I love the competition aspect of it. I've, I've been staying with Ott and Andy this year and uh, enjoying hanging out with those guys. Uh, they're a lot of fun to be around on your off days and, and, and at the night when you come in. You probably, you know, you know what I'm talking about when you're just you're staying with some guys that you're having mm-hmm. fun with and, and enjoying it. Uh, what drives me on? I, I, I want to win the next tournament. I, I just, I, 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 you, who, who doesn't like winning? That's a fair point. Do you think you'll ever win on a glide bait? I should have won on a glide bait at Norman. If I, it, this is how inexperienced I am on it. I put it on the biggest rod that I, I didn't know. Like maybe I should have went all the way up to the flipping stick, but I had it had it on a seven three heavy rod, and and I'm not going to even I'm not going to talk about fish lost, which happened, but just the accuracy of casting that bait. I've got now a prototype rod that Bass Pro's building. Uh, and another rod that that I'll just say it, it's Dobbins, you know, uh, uh, like the West Coast, the, the guru Dobbins guy. Mm-hmm. I can now throw that bait where I want it to go. Like accuracy, like when I was trying to throw it with my rod, I couldn't get it where I needed it. Or if I take me multiple casts or, you know, then by the time your boat's out of position or you might hit the dock and uh, – Heck, it could have been one at Norman, in my opinion, on that bait. It just could. I know Brian, you know, had a pretty good lead the final day, but if, you know, the people that would have seen what I saw on my boat, uh, I learned a lot that event. Um, I actually, I, I don't know if I told you this or not, I went and I fished with a kid that had given me a KGB glide bait two or three years ago. I didn't think anything of it. I just thought it was super nice of him. And uh, I, I put his phone number in my phone and I called him and, and I'm sitting here at the house like I am now thinking about Gunnersville. Well, I was thinking about Norman and I was like, man, that bait there would probably separate me from the crowd as far as getting a bigger bite there with as many bites as I expect to get there. And uh, I called him up and I said, man, I need you to teach me about it. So I drove to Arkansas. I went fishing with him on some of those lakes in Northwest Arkansas and he really got me going on it. And, uh, um, big thanks to him because I wouldn't be doing it without Cole. Really? Yeah. Dude, uh, that's, that's, I don't think people understand. Like, you're Edwin Evers. You have millions of dollars in winnings. We just talked about you've won everything. And you're still that ate up with learning about it to, to call someone up to go down and help. That is a big time lesson right there. Big time <laughs> lesson that anybody listening to this can, can learn a lot from as far as becoming a better, well rounded angler. Yeah. Cole's the man on it. Like he is, he is for a kid. I, I think all those younger generation is, but Cole mm-hmm. is like, he can throw a glide bait. I learned a tremendous amount. I still call him to this day every now and then just run different scenarios by him and uh, ask him, Hey man, what, what, I got this scenario. What do I need to do different? And, and he'll tell me. Why do you think it is not has not been up until the last couple of years that this thing has taken off at a national level? I remember two. What was the elite series on Bull Shoals? The one Christie won with the spook around the bushes. Yep. Poche had a really good. You remember what year that was? Uh, oh, I could look it up. I have a computer. 15, right maybe here. 15, 16, yeah. 17. Okay, so like ten years ago. Yeah, I remember Brandon Polinick had a box. And in that box, he had uh, a Gancraft Jointed Claw 178 SS. And he I've had, got, you've got those? I bought all those 10 years ago. Yeah. I've and he had, uh, I've got the Roman, Roman made, made. I yep. in Japan. I was over in Japan 12 years ago. I bought some Roman maids. I've had them all in my box. I just Okay. Never- so why now is everyone pulling them out and doing stuff with it? It's not, I mean, YouTube has been around. There's been, you've seen tactical bass and you see, I mean, this stuff has been out there. It's not like, it's like, oh my gosh, this new bait. But why now is it being utilized in the tournament scenario? And very rarely, very rarely before, I mean, we've seen big soft swim baits, obviously Steve Kennedy, Skeet Reese, Byron Velvick on uh, Gunnersville and uh, Clear Lake. Uh, you had Carl Jacobson with the glide uh, five years ago in the open championship. We've seen a little bit up north and a fish here and there with uh, Polinick on the glide. We've seen a little bit, of, a, a little bit here and there, but why now all of a sudden is it, Oh, there's seven of the top 10 guys that are incorporating this into their arsenal. 
A couple questions, a couple things. Like, one, I just didn't know any better. Two, I thought it was like a big fish bait. Uh, I think the baits have gotten a lot better. You know, I think they've gotten easier to work. I think they've gotten uh, probably more accessible, too, to the general public. Um, But I think there's quite a bit of deal to work in those baits, you know, especially some of those earlier ones, you know. I tried those Roman maids and I fished them. I just didn't know when or where. And and it's probably my own fault for not maybe studying Ben Milliken a little bit more or maybe the, the information wasn't out there. Mm-hmm. I just didn't know when, where, and what to do with it. And mm-hmm. uh, it takes different equipment than I had in my arsenal to even throw the silly thing. Like Cole said, man, you got to throw it on 25. Oh, I can throw it on 20. I mean, heck, I lost my bait. I had two of them. Mike Lucas sent me two of them. I lost one of them. It broke me off on a fish. Shouldn't oh, have. No. You're casting it, so it's heating up your line two, three feet up. The next one I lost at the end of the uh, elimination round. And I am sitting there. I'm distraught. And I'm, I'm like dragging the bottom in the tournament with a spoon. I'm trying to find it. A homeowner walks down from his house. He said, Hey man, I got a magnet. You want to borrow it? I was like, thank you, Jesus. Because yes, I want to borrow it. I mean, I had all my confidence in this one bait. He brings this magnet down this big and a rope. I walk up and down that dock with that magnet. I pull up a gigantic piece of steel. I move (laughs) it over to the side. I'm dropping it, dropping it, dropping it, and I, I get the weight changed just a little bit. I raise it up. There's my trick shed. In the I, tournament. In the tournament. I had two more days. I had the knockout round and the championship round that I needed that bait. If How I did I not know about this story? I don't know. You didn't ask me. How long did it take you by the time you broke it off to the time you got it back? Probably 30 minutes. No way. And instead of just saying, screw it, you're, oh my gosh. I really wanted that bait back. Yeah. You don't understand. I, I I was almost to the point of swimming, but it was deep and it was mm-hmm. cold. I really wanted that bait back. The next yeah, day was, I had them all on 25. Yeah. I, I Yeah, it was. It was just, you just broke it off like on the cast just because of the momentum one, yeah. of the bait. Just, yeah, just. Oh. I was torquing it so bad because my rod wasn't stiff enough. I got you. And, uh, yeah, is this heating that line? Oh, yeah, I can't imagine that. I've Everyone's had that one bait, whether it's a crankbait that's rutted right or a jerk bait that's right, and then you have that sickening feeling the moment you realize that you've just made your last cast with it. And then you're like, why did I make that cast? Why had, had I retied? What? And you don't think you can catch them on anything else. Yeah. I could, I, yeah, I, I, in my mind, that was a really important bait for me. You know, I, I caught fish on a lot of other things, but – I wanted that bait. Mm-hmm. The The Glide is a very interesting bait. Uh, we've seen Spro that has partnered with KGB, and they've been working for a couple years now to get that Chad Shad just right. I think they actually just had the first you know, run to the public that went out. Right. Uh, you're very influential with bait designs and, and, and uh, uh, you know, with Pure Fish in a number of different companies. But when it comes to making a glide bait for the masses so to speak that is a very very challenging thing to do at at that level uh and i think that i would obviously say the the most popular one would be the s waiver 178 in the ss the slow sink uh with river to sea but is that something that your brain's working to on how can we develop this and stuff but i just know that with the internal weighting and the way those things work it is obsessive as the glide bait guys are it's really hard to to mass produce those things and keep everybody satisfied it is i think that's why you they're so hard to get because there are some really good ones uh you know that people are making in their garage and and they're selling all of them they can possibly sell like you know like in two minutes yes they're gone (laughs) And, and the only way you even know about it is if you happen to follow them on facebook or instagram or whatever it is you know I was talking to Matt Reed the other day and uh, Brian Snowden, a buddy of ours, he's making them and he mm-hmm. won't even get Matt Reed one because he's selling so many of them. I mean, it's just like, and I called Brian, I was kind of wanting one too. And I'm like, 
I guess he just can't keep up with all the ones that people are already asking him to build. I went and shot some stuff for Matt Re- or for Brian Snowden a couple years ago at uh, Table Rock. And it was like, I was going to get paid to do it. And I ended up no cash, but I got a barely legal first run Vixen in lime ice, never opened in the package for two days of work. I thought it was the steal of the century. Wow. It's still, it's literally in my living room on my tro- in, uh, quote That's trophy true. case in my trophy case in my, in my living room is that unopened, barely legal lime ice Vixen. First no, run. Remember where it had the chick on the front? question you matt on on your love for the sport the industry when you take payment for two days of work for a lure in a package and then fish with it i'm waiting for there will be an event where it's going to play but it has not yet it is not yet uh you think the glide base just going to be could continue to become more and more mainstream or do you think we just had a, a kind of a little run of of events where it played and it's always going to be kind of in the shadows and then rear its head every now and then it's so addictive to throw <laughs> i mean it's just so addictive to throw so i think it's going to be always always on on everybody's deck i think it's just a tool that we're going to use just like We've got a, a, a black and blue jig rigged up for that one lay down 10 minutes to go. You know, I think we're always going to have a glide bait on our deck, probably a couple different ones, you know, uh, uh, one to fish out deeper and one, you know, for a shallow situation. Uh, it's going to be on my deck. I know going forward. All right. Uh, let's change directions here. And I've wanted to talk to you about this and it is fish becoming accustomed to certain forward-facing sonar baits. I've had numerous conversations with guys about this this year. I've experienced it myself. You're a guy who's won hundreds of thousands of dollars with a jerk bait and your active target. And to me, going around to these fisheries that are receiving pressure in the opens with 230 boats, you can go drive down any lake and it doesn't matter where you are. There's guys doing figure eights with a jerk bait, throwing it suspended fish. And dude, they're not eating it like they used to. Mm-hmm. Have you noticed that? I have. And what I've noticed is I feel like there's a certain distance there that they're feeling the presence of that. When you shine that that active target or your live scope over there at those fish, in my mind, I, I just have to feel like they feel that pulsing, that noise of that, you know, when you get certain, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet to that fish especially on fisheries like fork or raven or or areas you know probably even grand when you're shining that thing at those fish they're they're just they've been shined at so much they swim off like i i cannot tell you how many times i i get up on a piece of structure and you see two or three fish swimming off and i know they're bass i mean i haven't even made a cast yet and they're swimming off they didn't do that the first couple years no no (laughs) so you think they're do you think that they're now being targeted so they're feeling the boat the wave slap on the boat the trolling motor maybe you're pinging from the 2d and now they know that they're associating that with something negative or do you think it is the the forward facing sonar like i'm i still haven't I, i guess i could ask scott palmer on wednesday from the bass tank when i have him on here but what are you have any research on what is actually going on on what is shooting out in front of the boat if there is anything discernible like because it's not like a tick 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 or a ping that you could hear like you know when you've got your normal transducer out of the water you don't think it is a tick 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 i mean i I don't think so you can hear it i feel like i hear it when i stick my ear down to that active target Um, i hear the ding 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 you do yeah okay i didn't you sure it's not your 2d I turn everything else off and then I stick my ear down there. I could be wrong. Okay. So there is, okay. But I feel like it's coming out of that transducer. So their feet and you think they hear it, they hear it. Or do you think it's a, like a something other weird six dimension detectable thing? I don't know that they hear it, but they feel it like they're like, I don't know. You, you know, you're asking me something that, but in my opinion, we're hypothesizing here, Edwin. Okay. In my opinion, yes, they feel it. Like I, I, I am scared to death to get too close to things. Like I, it drives me insane at Lake Fork last year. Like 
and and looking back at the event, it cost me catching more fish because I was trying to stay so far back off of them and be real stealthy. And uh, yeah, I, I do. Whatever reason, I've got something ingrained in my brain that I think they feel that presence of that ticking going forward. And that's because everyone's got it now and yeah. those fish have been targeted. So you think it's more the pressure, the, the feel of the sonar than the bait, because I also think that the jerk bait is not nearly as effective as it once was because you're seeing fish getting behind it. You're seeing fish doing cartwheels and figure eight around it. And it seemed like the first couple of years, if you got it within 10 feet where you had the ball of the fish and then the jerk bait and you had that shine the same. So you knew it was on the same parallel. That thing was like a heat seeking missile up to it and was T-boning it. And now it's, it's way different, at least in my opinion. Have you noticed that too with the bait? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Especially like down there at Caney, like I couldn't get them to touch a jerk bait. They would look at it a little bit, maybe follow it a few feet, then they were done. I, I don't know that I ever even caught one decent fish at Caney on a jerk bait, you know, which is a clear forward facing sonar type lake. Uh, yeah, I, I think we're gonna have to come up with a different thing. You know, it, the uh, whole minnow deal, like Jason won the classic on or, or some of that other stuff, a silent type bait, it's probably going to be the next thing. I think it's gonna... out there, that hover strolling. Yeah. Yeah. Have you messed around with the hover strolling at all? I haven't. I haven't. I haven't. I think Have it's got to be a bit, eh, a little bit. I think it's got to be, a, it's, well, it's, it's basically just a churched up to Mickey rig. Yeah. It's a little bit lighter, but I think it has the properties of a, wacky rig or a neko rig to where it never falls the same twice therefore it doesn't have a discernible signature so the fish can't get used to it how does that is that is that overthinking no i love it i think the more we think about it the better we become so no i I love it it's it's very interesting because like i said you've won a lot of money on that and you're i think you're very underrated when it comes to the forward facing technology with a jerk bait like you get in it and you can tell that you're dialed. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Especially on grand when you were catching up next to those posts down there and friggin' horse, you had that thing. You had that, <laughs> like it was, you knew you were going to catch one. Yeah. The water came up the final day and I didn't make the right adjustment. I still wanted to fish those fish that were out there deeper. Yeah. All right. What else you got? You looking forward to Gunnersville here coming I up? Am. That's going to no, absolutely be a banger, isn't it? A long time since we've been there, and uh, I've not been there with the whole eelgrass invasion. So uh, uh, I'm kind of I'm kind of excited to see that and and see what's different there to see if anything that we used to fish uh, is still good down there. But heck, who could not be excited to go to Gunnersville? I I've had some great great tournaments and a lot a lot of fun there. All right, so I've got the open coming up on Wheeler, which I know nothing about, but in my limited research that i've been able to find same thing there eelgrass galore really which i I don't really know how to fish i guess that's a whole thing on the tva now a lot more eelgrass on the tva than there had been because it's all somewhat connected if you said there's an eelgrass invasion going on at gunnersville you know that that would really in my mind help wheeler a bunch because it never had apparently it's fishing phenomenally i have no idea how but uh, (sighs) apparently it's the deal right now it's the best lake on the tva chain Really? Yeah. Awesome. I'll be watching you then. I can't wait to see that. Have you ever done any any damage out of eelgrass before? Florida, you know, early in the year, you know, cranking like a, a crankbait over the top of it. Um, but always like February type stuff. You know, okay. I, I, I've uh, caught some fish down in Okeechobee and stuff, flipping it. But no, other than that, like later in the year, I've never had Very to frustrating to me in my limited experience. I don't understand it. Yeah. Like, I don't understand how the fish sit in the eelgrass when there's no, like, actual, like, noticeable current. Huh. But they must like it. Yeah. I, I think any any grass is a good grass, you know, just is better than no grass at all. And that's coming from an Oklahoma guy. Yeah. Wow. What else you got, Edwin? Man, that's it, I guess. Uh, just uh, glad to be on here with you, Matt. Enjoy following you and – uh. You're you're the real deal with this Bass Talk Live, man. It's a it's a 
uh, I don't always get to watch you live, but I sure enjoy listening to you as I'm driving to the next event. It just catches me up on all the news in the fishing world. Man, you're knocking it out of the park. And we all miss Mark, but you've taken it to a whole nother level, Matt. Thank you. Uh, we'll have to get together and go watch Mark coach uh, bowling for <laughs> SNU this year. We could like get signs, like, you know, go Mark, oh, go coach cool. Jeffries. He's got jerseys for all of them. He's got a recruiting budget. He's been really particularly heavy up in the in the northern states. Apparently, that's where the high school. But just like you are recruiting for the high school fishing team, he's he's literally has a recruiting board of the bowlers that he wants from each state. He's got like his linchpin guy. He has to do the female and the the men's side. He's got the locker room dialed in. Wow. Have you seen any of this stuff? No, I haven't. You haven't seen any of this stuff? Hold on. Let me see what we got going here. I know coaching the high school team, my poor dip net's like two foot shorter because I just I'm gnawing the end of it sitting there just wanting them to make a cast next to a log and they miss it by two foot or or uh, um, I, it is the hardest thing I've ever done coaching trying to coach people fishing. I, I, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, holy cow! There's been some massive upgrades to the SNU bowling website. We're sh we're sharing the screen here. So tell no, me what SA, SAU? Stands? SNU, Southern Nazarene University. Okay. Like it's the real deal. Like he's competing against, like this is a top level. He's the head football coach or head bowling coach. They gave him a salary. They gave him a recruiting budget. It's like a new sport for the school. I went to his, uh, I went to his announcement deal. Like all the news stations were there and stuff. And Jeffries goes up there and gives his little spiel about how proud he is. So this is the bowling. Look, there's oh, all their wow. jerseys. That is cool. There's the women's team. This is the bowling alley or the, the. You know, he's loving that. Oh, he has to be. Yeah. Look, look at this. Is this not the most vintage Mark Jeffries video ever for SNU bowling? Yeah. That is cool. There's the locker room. He's got the names of the guys up there. He's got a film room. I'm embarrassed to say I did not know there was collegiate bowling. I, I just oh, dude, it's big time. I didn't know. Look at that. Look at the graphics. Huh. The lightning bolt in it. The crimson storm is building. <laughs> oh yeah. Cool. That's cool. That's I'm happy for you, Mark. If you're too. listening, I'm super happy for you, bud. Yeah. He <laughs> also helped with the uh with the new intro as well. He was like, I better get credit for the new intro. Yeah. So, all right, Edwin, I'm going to let you go, take a final break of the show, and then uh, and then come back, wrap things up, and kind of preview next week. But like I said, uh, a rare off week for you guys in between. You have so many of you guys that are fishing the uh, Invitationals and the BPTs and then mixing and matching, throwing in Toyota Series, uh, that it's it's hard to find a week where you're actually just home hanging out. Oh, one more question. What's the what is the pecan season? I had a couple of people ask about that. That that's still rolling. Oh yeah. Well we we hopefully you start harvesting around you know October 15th. So we'll have fresh pecans, you know, re usually around November first. Uh we made it through all the late freezes in April. It's looking really, really good. So I was just out there uh, last week. Very nice. All right. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the hour of time. Much appreciated and expecting big things out of Gunnersville. I think the last time you fished Gunnersville had to have been the big or, or like for a regular was that would have that, that have been the big Bastrix event where the seven inch Bastrix were out yeah, and that was the deal. Green. I think yep, Skeet yep. and Derek Remitz was throwing it. Velvic yep. was throwing it. Yep. The only reason <laughs> I know that is I went through my. Uh, I was cleaning out some stuff in my garage and I came across five packs of those original OG seven inch Bastrix. Unopened. Are they still good? Or are they all super oily? Okay. So two packs are really oily. Three packs are, go are gold. I don't understand what makes those old Bastrix oily oh, or normal. A bunch of them too. And like, you just, they're just like, it had to be the dipping process because of how soft it would be. I believe those originals were like, there's like a 27 stage hand dip process. And then, you know, that's how the, it'd be like basically a Sharpie that drew the design on and stuff. The original yeah. dude who had it, there had to be some sort. My thought process is as they heat, a couple of those layers melt okay. because they're so thin. That's just, yeah, that's just a theory though. Are they still kind good? of makes sense. Yeah, I actually uh, threw one at Bugs Island, and it 
I forgot how good it was with the head with the head wobble and stuff. You're like, you know, you're reeling it and you can feel that little yeah. on your rod and you're like, oh, dude, this is going to get freaking munched. And I, I caught a chain pickerel on it. <laughs> I didn't know they had chain pickerel on there. Like two casts in day two of the morning. I'm like, yeah, there's my kicker for the day. And I boat flip it. And I'm like, it's a freaking pike. <laughs> I'm glad we don't have those here in Oklahoma. There are no chain pickerel in Oklahoma. Not that I know. You do know that our northern guess what the Oklahoma Northern Pike State record is. You know, you're having to look it up. I, I have no, no I want to make sure because I can't remember the name. It's like 26 pounds. There's Northern Pike in Oklahoma. So the uh Department of Wildlife, here it is. I'm pulling it up. Oklahoma. Pike, Northern Pike. Oh, I messed I messed it up. Uh 36 pounds, eight ounces. Wow. They did a long time ago they did like a test sample to see in on western oklahoma out in like carl etling yeah to see if they could establish a population of pike and they never reproduced but that initial run got freaking massive really? so there was like a five or ten year period there where these giant pike got caught and then the cycle died out since they didn't reproduce they didn't restock them so the uh Raymond Fernandez is 36 pound, eight ouncer in 1976 out of Carl Etling, which is a, that's a freaking big pike, Edwin. Giant pike. It, it's a duck eater. Yeah. That will probably stand forever. Did, did you see the giant carp in the carp, the, the uh, carp national championship this past weekend? Uh-uh. Where? Last pro deal. 70, the winning team had 700 and something pounds of carp. The, they were shooting 70-pound carp with their uh, bow and arrows. Oh, on the Neosho? Uh, I thought it was out of Memphis on the Mississippi River. I could be wrong. I just saw Oh, no, but I just pulled up something that an Oklahoma angler won a, just caught a world record big head carp. In Oklahoma we got them? A 110-pound big head carp That's not on the Neosho River. So that's going to be up to Arkansas. Okay. That's wow. not good. No, that's not good at all. They had a big rodeo, like a big, big carp shooting rodeo over in Mississippi. You know, 700 pounds. 700 pounds worth. That's your stringer. That's Why you put 700 pounds in your boat? <laughs> that's a big carp. Is uh, that the one where they put them in like trash cans and then donate yeah. them and stuff afterwards? Yes. I've never done that. Are you – have you ever done I hear it's a lot of fun. Kevin Van Dam's kind of got into that boat fishing and he says it is an absolute blast. Dude, if he could shoot, catch, or capture it, Van Dam's all about it. Yeah, he is. All right, Edwin, enjoy the rest of your morning. Thanks for jumping on. I had a freaking blast. I did too. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate you. All right. See ya. Bye. All right. That was the one and only Edwin Evers. And yeah, uh, we always talk about uh Greg Hackney just being like the Bassmaster classic shy of the uh, trifecta, but Edwin has the the AOI, the Red Crest, and the Classic. So just the Bassmaster Angler of the Year, and I think Hackney also has a a Toyota Series uh, win or Angler of the Year too. So a little bit different. But hey, we're gonna take our final break of the show when we come back. Like I said, uh, talk a little bit more about Bugs Island, and then I also uh, have an update on the St. Jude fundraiser that we did with the Dick Highly. Bass Classic that was supposed to be this past week and it was actually postponed till October. We're going to talk about that, talk about what we got going on coming back. It's BTL on a Monday. We'll be back right after this. Shoreline Boat and RV. Dock rash, storm damage, collision repair. That deep scratch or gouge from trying to access that secret creek. Shoreline Boat and RV can get your prize possession back in mint condition and looking good on the water. Fast. All repairs are done in-house, so they're able to get your boat or RV back to brand new quickly. All Shoreline's work comes with a rock-solid warranty. Find out more at ShorelineBoatAndRV.com. Kansas City, Austin, and Tulsa. I'm the kind of guy that never leaves a house without a pocket knife, and Gamagatsu's come out with the EDC series of knives. EDC stands for everyday carry, so whether you're on the water or off, you can always have it with you. The best thing about it to me is that assisted open feature. With this D2 blade, you've got it right here at your fingertips. So if you can't find your scissors, you need to cut a knot, you need to cut your braid, you've always got it. 
Make sure you check it out. Never leave home without your Gamagatsu EDC knife. Born in Japan, using technology, innovation, and precision, Sunline produces the widest selection of fishing lines at the most technologically advanced line factory in the world. Manufactured at the strictest tolerances to produce victories at the highest levels of tournament yes, bass fishing. Sir. From household names like Christie, Swindle, and Cruz, to young guns like Cook, Logan, New, and Welcher, they all trust Sunline to take them to the top of the leaderboard. Choose the line that will give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. Sunline. Are you looking to install your own fishing electronics? The solution is the Bass Tank Power Harness. It takes the guesswork out of installation. No more voltage issues or interference. Designed by an engineer so that you can get professional results right there in your own garage. Installation done right with the help of the Bass Tank Power Harness. You can feel confident knowing that your installation was done right. The Bass Tank Power Harness. Give us a call or order yours today at thebasstank.com. Get the best patterns backed by tournament data. Start by finding the best 10% of your lake. Know exactly what to look for and what to throw. After that, you just put them in the boat. Try the deep dive app today. Look at that beast right there. Having confidence in your tackle while on the water is one of the main things to success in my opinion. In the last couple of years with Denali, I've had just that. From anything from spinning rods, casting rods, tungsten products, even now to casting and spinning reels, I have the confidence to go out there and get the job done and know that all my equipment is gonna handle it and do it just the way I want it. The thing about Denali is you've got great quality products at a great price point, so make sure you check them out. All right, wrapping things up here on a Monday, BTL. Back in the studio for a week before I head right back on the road for the fourth Bassmaster Open EQ of the season on Wheeler Lake. I uh, wanted to give an update on the Dick Highly St. Jude Bass Classic that many of you purchased a, uh, a fundraiser t-shirt for or uh, and or uh, donated directly to the cause. Uh, that was scheduled for May 6th and 7th, which would have been uh, yesterday and the day before that. Now it's going to go directly from Bugs Island to the Dick Highly St. Jude Bass Classic up at Wabasha, Minnesota on the Mississippi River, fishing with Adam Bartuzek uh, of the Crappie Chronicles and well, Toyota Series fame now after a second place finish at Kentucky Lake a couple weeks ago. But that event was postponed due to like record high water. Like everything was underwater there, completely unsafe boating conditions. They had no op uh, option but to postpone that. They believe they're postponing it to uh, October. Uh, but that being said, I wanted to have a massive shout out to the BTL listeners uh, who supported it. In total so far, we raised $2,919 in t-shirt sales uh, directly to the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and total $9,000 $54 uh, through donations and the fundraiser that we did uh, that we did in February uh, in Minnesota. So uh, blew away our totals. I think we did about 6,000 last year uh, between Adam and myself. So 9,000 massive thank you to everybody who uh, donated to that, who helped. And I don't know, uh, obviously I think we're probably going to continue that through October. I'm going to fish it with, uh, with Bart once they come out with the official I think I know what weekend they're going to have it in, but he was like, Hey, that's going to be even better fishing than it would have been in May. So, uh, also want to make note, uh, have closed the BTO apparel shop. Uh, going to do kind of a reset, a little bit of a reset there, come out with a new line of stuff, maybe a couple new uncle Frank shirts. Uh, so look for that probably sometime around, uh, around the first of June. Uh, and then also want to congratulate, Really cool story there. I know we mentioned the Lake of the Ozarks event with uh, Marshall Robinson making a run at it, but John Cox fishing both the Elite Series and the MLF Invitationals. 55-14, three-day total, wins a sight fishing event at Lake of the Ozarks. And then his best friend, Keith Carson, if you remember, they did a big deal. Uh, Pure Fishing did a big deal when they both made the Bassmaster Classic a couple years ago. Best friends kind of grew up together in that Florida area. Uh, always dreamed of doing this. Obviously, uh, Keith Carson's incredible angler in his own right. Uh, MPFL, MLF, Invitationals. But John Cox and Keith Carson, best friends since childhood, go 1-2. 55, 14, and 54, 13. Uh, and I think we all know how good John Cox is, but 
a little stat that I kind of found that I don't think many people realize. I haven't seen it mentioned anywhere else. This is a win on the Tackle Warehouse Invitational. So I'll go on all the way back to the uh, FLW Tour days. He has won one of these in four out of the last five seasons, a win on the Invitationals. And when you think about that schedule only including six tournaments a year, it's pretty dang impressive. Pretty dang impressive for the one and only John Cox. All right, tomorrow, Ben Milliken joins the show to break down a grinder of a of a Bassmaster Open off Bugs Island. Like I said, we've seen what he did with the big stick offshore in the first two opens, but he had to make some adjustments, rapidly changing conditions, flipping, drop shotting, no glide baits this time. How he got it done to remain in the mix. I think he dropped a fifth overall in the standings with like a 60-something place finish in the open EQ on Bugs Island, but he will break it down tomorrow and then Wednesday Bass Tank owner Scott Palmer and Arizona's Josh Bertrand that's all we got for a Monday everybody good to be back in studio we will talk to everybody tomorrow see ya